Hello and welcome to Holy Scriptures and You. This is where we get together and talk about scriptural backgrounds that we need to understand the Holy Orthodox faith. The church, the real church, looks like Jesus Christ, our Savior, looked on earth. To the external eye, not believing who he was, he looked like a dusty prophet with rabbi tassels, followed by a group of disciples, and saying very strange things, going counter to everything that the Jews have been teaching. Keep the law and you're just fine. Sacrifices will make up for all of your sins, which was in those days, up until the time of John Baptist, was the acceptable way, and God had this for them in order to realize how sinful they were. They had to sacrifice blood on the altars to realize what was happening within them. It was extremely destructive, and they needed to be purged by blood. This was a foretelling, of course, of Christ's all-holy blood, which was what was foretold in the sacrifice of animals. There is none of that because he is sufficient for every sacrifice. Whenever we are martyred ourselves or any of our brothers and sisters, that is to partake of the sufferings of Christ. Not our own separate sacrifices. No, we are one with Christ, having received the body and the blood not just appearances, but infused. The reality of bread and wine carries out what they are, bread to feed our bodies and infused with the divine nature and energies to feed our souls and our minds and to restore us and the precious blood to wash us from inside out. Body, don't skip over that, I'll tell you why and soul, mind, and will. All of that perfected by Jesus Christ as God and man. Now, the reason we are called orthodox is because of what assails the church at all times in all ages. You see often this beautiful icon of the ark. It has Jesus Christ as the head, leading the apostles who are rowing or they're putting up the sails, whichever. And then around the shores, you have out of, thankfully, out of reach, people, people shooting arrows. These are the heretics trying to destroy the church. Ark, the ark of the church, signified by Noah way back, is still present. That what is foretold, that which was foretold, is now living among us. As the temple in the new Jerusalem, and as the ark for all the nations, that's what those animals signified all the animals in creation that were there extant that the Lord wanted to save. Those are the Gentile nations. So nothing in the Old Testament is without meaning, but we must look at it from the perspective of Christ and the church. That will give meaning to all that went before it since it fulfills the meaning of those shadows and types. So the church looks like Christ on the earth. It is, um, it is mocked, especially by the Roman Catholics, I've told you. And uh, the Protestants just dismiss us as the, uh, something like the Catholic Church. And they left the Catholic Church, of course. The main counterfeit church religion 
is that of the papacy. They call it the third fall. Uh, Satan fell, the fathers tell us, of course, from the heavens. Isaiah 11, plunging down, Christ said, I saw him plunge down because of his pride. Secondly, the fall of Adam, heartbreaker, and the Lord himself became man to go retrieve Adam from Hades and to retrieve all of us, to rescue us from the effects of that sin of mortality, not guilt for a sin, but we have the effects of that sin in mortality, that is death, and corruption. That's why he gives us the Eucharist. As the new Adam, he feeds us a replacement that will take the place of that mortality and corruption. 1 Corinthians 15. So, the major push for tolerance in one church world is the papacy. That's what it was designed to do. Charlemagne founded that church in 800, and in it, by the sword, he united, quote-unquote, everyone, forced converted them, and uh, made them serfs. That's where the feudal system began. Now, if you realize, I don't know if you do, according to Cardinal Vigano, who is a good truth teller within this church, I don't know why he hasn't become orthodox, he probably is secretly orthodox, but he is telling us there was a conference before Pope Francis was put in place. And that conference was a secret conference in Switzerland. And the design they planned was to take Benedict out, retire him, which of course never has been done, and to put in place the man of the hour, the Marxist man, the Jesuit man. The Jesuits were behind Vatican II, I was there, I can tell you a lot about it, in 1966 when it was promulgated. But uh, that destroyed the church insofar as it was any kind of institution at all. When you have the rules collapse, everything goes because there's no Christ there. Um, so they put in place this Marxist Jesuit, Pope Francis, and he had previously been in Argentina. So even though the Catholic, Roman Catholic, Papal Church looks, has adopted some of our liturgy, some of our vestments, sacraments, uh, automatic, very different than ours. The uh, Orthodox mysteries, we call them, are not automatic. You can receive the Eucharist without faith and nothing happens. It's not automatic. Wake up. You must bring faith to every mystery. And there must be baptism at the beginning. I was chrismated when I came in and I knew it didn't feel right. I had one foot in one world and the other foot in the other. I wanted to be fully orthodox. And sure enough, I discovered there were some real problems. As soon as I got the baptism, I was lined up with the proper right-believing bishops, and those problems that I saw in the semi-Orthodox or diluted Orthodox Church became solved when I saw the real teachings from my friend Saint Irenaeus, my patron, who is Father James and I's spiritual father, even from the early church. In a word, there is no other church, there is no other baptism, except the Holy Orthodox baptism. With the fullness of the creed, the Nicene Creed, believed 
lived and the fullness of the uh, scriptures read and understood with the commentaries of the fathers. How do I know this? Because I've been there. The calling to be a missionary. I went into be a missionary with this, what I thought was the early church. It wasn't. And the Lord had to teach me what it was at the heart of this counterfeit church so I would be able to discern this and later teach it. I had no idea I was going to be doing this. The Lord told me right then, the third year of the novitiate, I was going to be leaving the church and the convent, not to worry. So I had to keep being educated. That was part of my assignment from the Lord. As soon as I left after Vatican II, the shambles that was left, it's worse than even the lay Catholics know. When you're in the, the heart of the church, where the Jesuits were, right across the street from us, being educated like our nuns were, you know exactly what was happening. They were letting all the secular world wash through. What happened to the Jesuits, this is further proof, false church means I can make up rules, change everything. In the true church, the truth never changes. Our divine liturgy goes back to the collated version uh, during the time of St. John Chrysostom, 325, 350 AD. And that was disseminated throughout all the churches in the known world, including in Europe. Divine liturgy has not changed. Now, a problem here too is our own clergy, some of whom are cradle orthodox. And when they hear sacraments and rosaries, things like uh, terms like this, they think they're all the same because the Greek especially used these terms. I was shocked when I heard our Jerusalem Patriarch, Patriarchate uh, Archbishop, Damaskinos say, oh yes, we're going to have Mass. I said, why are we having Mass? What do you mean? He says the divine liturgy, of course, but we call it Mass in Jerusalem. Oh my Lord, have mercy. So, and then you'll find people picking up the prayer rope and calling it a rosary. They don't know what the rosary is. The rosary is the exact opposite of the Jesus prayer. And have the belief in Christ, in the Protestant case, uh, paramount without a lot of teaching from the New Testament to tell the Protestant believer how to live in Christ and because of him. Again, because there's no church that give a pattern of the holy tradition along with the scripture in order to explain it, not replace it. Did you hear, Protestants? The scripture is not replaced by holy tradition. It is explained and lived, lived out in the holy tradition. Again. Now we have the Protestant problems, just explained. And of course, the papal church is the genesis of the problems of pushing against the original church. And they are using a totalitarian approach where the head of their church, one head, like a pyramid, uh, is totally infallible, which means he's God. And that, of course, is not true. No one can be infallible. So, but the devil has arranged this from Charlemagne's time so that all he has to do is have a bad person at the pinnacle and he can move the whole base of the church with it because people have been taught deceptively that whatever the Pope says is true and infallible and therefore the will of God and I must follow him. The Jesuits have had a saying that I will follow the Pope into hell rather than follow 
any other thing, including scripture. So watch for this. This is underneath the blankets, as it were. Uh, not uh, very many Roman Catholic lay people understand this. Another point about the Jesuits, again, in our own times. 1966, they changed very quietly their vow of chastity to a vow of not being married. Oh, my goodness. What does that leave them room to perhaps do in their personal lives? I don't want to judge because many, I'm sure Jesuits, try to live out the three vows as they were. But because the young ones coming up are believing that it's just not the external being married, you have the appearances being kept without the heart being devoted to Christ. And again, there are exceptions in every case. I've known beautiful Protestants, I've known wonderful Catholics, but it's in spite of the churches they are in. It's because of the total grace of God that is poured out because they've cried out to Him. It's not because of the church they are holy. In other words, it is in spite of their institutions that they manage, especially Protestants, because they have the Scripture. But they can manage if they call on Christ, and of course they will be saved. This is not the reason that we want to be ecumenical. In fact, it is the reason we need to go after these people and say, look, how much easier it is to have the grace-bearing mysteries of Christ, baptism, Eucharist, that, that are pouring out the grace of God from our head, Jesus Christ. How much better is that? To have the New Testament church explain in the holy tradition and lived out as the apostles taught us to do. St. Paul remember that famous statement that Protestants don't like at all. And that is, follow my example, follow me. The way I live, in other words, he tells Timothy and his other churches, Titus, do what I do. I am your example. Not because of pride, realization, but because he was fully given over to an apostle's message and an apostle's ministry. And the Lord spent three years in the desert with him, teaching him. And he makes that point. He's a full apostle because why? He has met Christ. First at Damascus Road experience and after that, the Lord continued to teach him for three years in the solitude of the deserts. So just be aware of these things. And these are replete in our tradition about the Apostle Paul. So you need these traditions to explain why Scripture is so important and what it means to our own life in Christ. So we have two false churches, man as the infallible papal church, and the other is an authoritarian church based on a, a problem with their interpretation of Scripture. They do not have holy tradition. Therefore, they have everything but. They start their own traditions. Protestants are shattered into many, many broken pieces. But we can bring them back with that essential mental assertion that Christ is my Savior and the attempt to live out that in their will. If you search that out as I did and as a charismatic Christian who believed in the book of Acts and all of the scriptures, the Lord will take you by the hand with the Holy Spirit baptism and lead you into the fullness of the Orthodox faith. All right, in my own search, how do I know this? Am I, is it just my opinion? No. The Lord has put me through the, hard, the school of hard knocks. Uh, I had to fall flat on my face after the Jesuit, the uh, institution of the papacy, ripped away what little faith I had left I was going on, my fuel tank was on empty, and I was going along just following his mighty providence. 
as much as I could and came out to the California area from Chicago and began to teach in the Catholic schools. And of course that was a fiasco because the Catholic Church itself was such a mess and still is, by the way. In that search for Christ, I asked what to do after coming into the charismatic movement. The Lord got a hold of me, filled me with that baptism again that I'd had in the convent, and then he started leading me into all the truth. 1981, a huge word of knowledge, giant letters on the wings of the dove of the Holy Spirit coming right at me, Gnosticism on one side, Irenaeus on the other. What brought the Lord to that point? He had to show me the thick-skinned and the thick-headed one. He had to show me by visible means, a word of knowledge, it's called, what was going on. It answered my prayer that I had just said, Lord, what is behind this charismatic insanity of naming and claiming scripture and using it against God, thinking I can use scripture independently of God in order to wrest out from his grasp, so-called, all the riches I want, fill my passions, feed my passions, and I can have everything I want on earth, and then I'm saved and I'll go to heaven. All of this tragedy has been wreaked on the Protestant and especially charismatic churches. The name it and claim it, the prosperity movement, whatever you call it, harks back to old Judaism, like so much of Christianity in America, and does not come into the Savior Christ and his church in which he says, learn of me. For what? I am meek and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Instead, we have so much vying for power, uh, ambition, wealth. We cannot serve mammon and the Lord. How many times have we heard that in Paul? St. Paul also says the love of money is what? The love of money is the root of all evil. It will make me do incredibly bad things. Even use scripture as the devil used it against Christ. Trying to be tempting to others after I have fallen myself. To go after wealth, which is dust and ashes, instead of the treasure of Christ and following him. Orthodox Christians totally involved in our hymns, our prayers. I recommend the Octoikos, O-C-T-O-E-C-H-O-S, in all the tones, one and two, three and four, five, six, seven and eight. Two tones in each little volume here. You can get them from the Serbian uh, 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 also St. Vlad's Press, from the Sebastian Press, Serbian, and I'm sure others. Uh, so this will help you every day. For instance, we're in the seventh tone right now, so you'll have Sunday's rejoicing tones in the resurrection, and Monday for the Holy Angels, Tuesday, St. John Baptist, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, so on, Saturday for the repose. And you will have a different set of readings that will keep you from, it will keep you just incredibly interested. Unless you're a rock, and I don't think you are. 
Also, this is the Pascha, the Eight Tones, centered on the resurrection. Now this is the example of a monthly feast day reading book. It's called a Meneon, which is simply monthly. And this is February. Each of the 12 months has one of these. You will go through all of the uh, dates and the major saints. Between those two, you will do four from this reading, four from that reading, or three and seven, whatever the combination is. You will get packed in your mind. You will get so wonderfully educated by the hymns that are drawn from Scripture around either the monthly feasts or the resurrection and the incarnation, of course, which began this great work of Christ in us to rest. And again, we have many books, Heaven Meets Earth, by lay theologian John Skinas, up here in San Francisco near us, and it is available on Ancient Faith, I'm sure others too. This is just one example. We got extra copies just for you. And we have coloring books that aren't really just coloring books. They're for mom and dad to read with the children. So we have those given by Archbishop Lazar, who is a consummate teacher and wonderful uh, lover of the Holy Orthodox Faith. So please write to us at the address here. God bless and keep you is our prayer. And receive all of our love in Christ Jesus our Lord.